Good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the Rappaport Forum. There is no doubt that civil procedure commands our interest and you are all close to God for recognizing the most important subject matter area in the whole law school. So we thank you. Uh, the Harvard Law School Rappaport Forum was launched in 2020 to promote full, open, and vigorous discussion, a respectful clash of ideas, and I think that's what we will see here this afternoon, with respect to critical and complicated issues facing our community, our nation, and our world. Uh, it is made possible uh, through the generous gift of the Rappaport Foundation and built on the legacy of the Harvard Law School Forum, which Jerry Rappaport um, supported, founded, in the wake of the Second World War to provide aspiring lawyers with regular opportunities to engage with ideas and issues connected to the study of law and to a rapidly changing world. Jerry Rappaport uh, passed away in 2020, but his many contributions to the Harvard Law School and to American life will live on uh, for generations to come. Uh, so it is important to acknowledge uh, this afternoon, uh, the many contributions and the support for the Rappaport Forum, and to thank Jerry and Phyllis Rappaport, um, who, for the many decades of support of the Harvard Law School and their generous commitment, discourse, and particularly for their generosity. And also, it is a pleasure this afternoon, uh, my name is Keith Charles, I'm a law professor here, uh, to also thank uh, those of you who are here, to thank the dean and the dean's office and the communications department, Professor Glenn Cohen, and of course our distinguished guests, uh, to talk about what I think is one of the more important, though it might seem arcane, but only for the brilliant, uh, questions of our day, which is how should we think about democracy while we may be ruled by uh, one judge, the question of universal injunctions. Now fairly quickly, just to get us started, because you really want to hear from our two amazing distinguished guests. Uh, those of you who may remember your civil procedure, I'm sure you will not forget it. Those of you who are litigators know that courts, including the federal courts, have the power to provide equitable remedies. Uh, so instead of asking for money damages, a plaintiff can ask the court or the defendant to do something or to refrain from doing something. Uh, and of course, injunctions are a classic equitable remedy. Uh, sometimes money won't do the job, so the court will order uh, a party on penalty of contempt to restrain from certain types of actions, and less commonly to ask for them to act. So you can think of this in the context of a restraining order. So today we're going to talk about the practice of nationwide or universal injunctions in our federal system. The worry here is that of a single judge issuing a nationwide order that bars not just the party, uh, the, the, that's just the government from action uh, with respect to the party in front of the court, but with respect to all other parties. Um, and these injunctions are sometimes focused on extremely salient, politically salient topics like the power of the admi of administrative agencies, immigration policy, Title IX, L LGBTQ plus issues, abortion, et cetera. Uh, and our goal for this afternoon, at least mine, is to have a better understanding of some of these questions. We will talk about what nationwide injunctions are, provide some uh, examples to get us going. We will also talk about whether they are new uh, and whether they are different from the last uh, 20 or 30 years. We'll think about the, their political salience um, whether these are bipartisan uh, structures or, um, or asymmetrically partisan structures. Uh, we'll also think and talk about, this is a law school after all, uh, whether they are constitutional and what are the problems with, constitutional problems with nationwide injunctions. And then we'll close uh, with some uh, policy considerations. Uh, so it is my distinctive privilege uh, to be uh, the person who ask questions without um, understanding what is going on, uh, but to really allow and facilitate uh, our two amazing experts, Sam Bray and Mila Sohoni. Sam is a Chicago grad who practiced at Mayor Brown. He is the uh, John N. Matthews Professor of Law at Notre Dame. Uh, and he's a renowned expert on remedies, equity, law, and religion, uh, and has written um, uh, prolifically and very thoughtfully uh, and this area. Mila is a graduate of the Harvard Law School uh, as well as Harvard undergrad uh, with an MPhil 
from Cambridge. Uh, she is a professor at uh, University of San Diego, uh, where she is the associate dean as well as the Herzog research professor. Uh, she too is a prolific scholar um, in this context. Uh, they, are, they have areas, some areas of agreement, uh, but I hope to surface even more areas of disagreement. Uh, and it is my distinct pleasure this afternoon to welcome them to the Harvard Law School uh, to walk us through some of the interesting, difficult, and thoughtful questions with nationwide or universal injunctions. Mila and Sam, welcome. Okay, so let's just start off. Uh, I'll take a seat just to be more engaging. Let's just start off with. What are, what are nationwide injunctions? What are these things? What do they mean? What are some examples? What is it that we're talking about? If I want to start with you, Sam, enlighten me anyway. So thank you all, and thank you, Dean Manning, and thank you, Guy, for the honor to be here. Um, so uh, this may be a disappointment if you want fireworks immediately, because I'll start with something that I think is going to be a point of agreement between Professor Sahoni and me. Um, so for what a nationwide or national or universal injunction is, the key distinction is about people, not places. So it's not that it's geographically broad, a district court giving an injunction that works out of the, outside the boundaries of that district court's jurisdiction. There's absolutely no problem with that. Um, if a uh, federal court enjoins uh, trademark infringement by A against B, it can enjoin that trademark infringement anywhere, anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. So there's no problem with geographic scope of injunctions. Actually, that was settled in equity back in the 1740s. Uh, the problem is about people. Uh, the, the, what makes these distinctive is they are injunctions that bind the defendant, in particular the federal government here, with respect to non-parties to the case. So that's the key distinction. It's scope with respect to people, <coughs> not scope with respect to place. Either of you, maybe you, you Mila, uh, provide us with just some exam prominent examples, especially in the last few years, uh, just so that we understand substantively some of the things that we may be thinking and, and engaging in. Yeah, should you want to do Sorry. Feel free. Uh, so we had the, the injunctions against uh, DACA and DAPA during the, um, during the Obama administration. We had an injunction against the um, Trump administration's implementation of uh, rules affecting contraception uh, out of the uh, Eastern District of Pennsylvania during the, during the Trump administration. And then you know, more recently, we've had Biden student, uh, debt, uh, the Biden student Debt Forgiveness Program, which was uh, enjoined uh, nationwide before being invalidated by the Supreme Court. Um, a very famous one that you're probably, uh, that you'll probably remember is uh, Trump v. Hawaii, which involved uh, uh, Trump's uh, Muslim ban, um, uh, which he promulgated soon after he came into office. So all of these cases have been, you know, in the news. You you know you've read about all of them. You probably learned all of, uh, about many of them in law school already. All right. So is this is this new? Is this different? Um, have the last uh, few years uh, have we seen a spike in nationwide injunctions? Why do we care now? So uh, you know, I, I think we have to distinguish between uh, two things: how like how old are they? How how far do they go back? And has there been a more recent uptick? Um, now I don't think that these injunctions are new. I think that they date back um, to roughly the same period of time in which federal courts first started issuing purely plaintiff protective injunctions against the enforcement of state or federal laws. Supreme Court in 1913 uh, issued a nationwide injunction itself. The Supreme Court in the 1920s uh, affirmed a universal injunction against the state law. Lower courts in the 1920s and the 1930s universally enjoined really consequential federal agency action. Um, and you know, if you can, you can, you can keep on. I can keep on going right, like through the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. Um, so these you know, these injunctions, you know, they were not you know invented by sort of hippie skippy flower children judges on the DC circuit in 1965. That's not, that's not uh, how, how it happened. Um, so you know, I think that the pedigree of these injunctions you know, reaches back you know, a century or more. And, and like I said at the beginning, they, it, they reach back, that pedigree reaches back 
to the same period when it was first recognized in cases like Ex parte Young and Philadelphia versus Stimson, that federal courts could issue injunctions against the enforcement of laws by state and federal officers. So I, I think that pedigree is long enough to satisfy um, any doubts about their constitutionality. If you're okay with a purely plaintiff protective injunction against the enforcement of state or federal law, you're, you should be okay uh, with the pedigree of these um, universal injunctions as well. Now turning to the more recent period, like the last um, 20 years or so, um, and if we're speaking just about nationwide injunctions and not about universal vacater of rules under the APA, which I don't know if we're going to get into that, but let's just set <laughs> let's just set Someone aside. Someone has written about aside. this recently, right. <laughs> I think. Right. right. <laughs> but if we are just talking about universal, uh, sorry, but about universal injunctions, I think it's true that in the last 20 years or so, um, there has been an increase in in, in their number. Um, and there was a particularly sharp uh, spike in them uh, during the Trump administration. Um, we can speculate as to why, or we can carry on. I, yeah, I'll, I, I wanted to ask about why, but Sammy, you want to you want to jump in there? So sure. We, we can't we can't keep the. Uh, it, it's not labeled the Rappaport Forum for Respectful Agreement, so we can't just keep that going the whole time. So, uh, um, so uh, history, when you use history in the law, um, as uh, everyone here knows, um, history can be read different ways. And that's a, that is true of the history with respect to national injunctions. So in my view, um, national injunctions uh, go back to 1963, and uh, they aren't, uh, aren't before then. Um, so we have different readings of different cases before. And for me, a big part of the story here is the hundreds or even thousands of suits attacking the New Deal legislation. The dog that didn't bark is that nobody asks for national injunctions. Like, nobody does because nobody thinks they can. So uh, we've got a different view of the history up to that point. But we completely agree that it is fairly peripheral on our judicial politics until you get to recently. And I would say it's less than 10 years ago. So it's President Obama's second term. It's immigration uh, policies he has. And then there's a um, nationwide injunction out of a district court in Texas. And that goes up with great speed to the Supreme Court. And Justice Scalia dies. And you get the, the uh, affirmance by an evenly decided vote. And we almost, in that case, had the first big constitutional decision on whether the take care clause is uh, a duty or not on the posture of a preliminary national injunction that has gone up really quickly to the Supreme Court. So that was sort of the, the opening of the floodgates. And since then, almost every major presidential initiative by President Obama, by President Trump, and by President Biden has been stopped with a nationwide injunction or uh, with Baker. So on the, Please, on the yes, historical on the record, right, I, I, um, I just want to point out something very important about, the, about what we know about history and what we don't know. Um, and that's that these injunctions are not easy to find. Right? They are part of the district court record. Sometimes they are reproduced in transcripts of record that you can access if those transcripts of record are then available through databases um, that are specific to that purpose. Um, they're not you know, in Westlaw, they're not in Lexis. ChatGPT does not know about them. Like, it, some of them you can only get by making Yet. this, yeah. <laughs> but some of them you can only get by making bespoke requests to the National Archives. Um, and I'm talking about injunctions that are as recent as the 1950s, right? I mean, some of these have taken me and my librarians um, you know, weeks or even months to find. So just there's a known unknown here about these injunctions. And with respect to the New Deal uh, injunctions, you know, one reason why you, you might not have um, sought one is if, is, is if the government was okay with not enforcing the law once it had been held to be unconstitutional beyond uh, the, the, the parties uh, to that suit. It may not have been as remarkable a, 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 um, a question. The scope of relief may not have been as remarkable in that time as, as it has become in ours. So just as just to illustrate, you know, Robert Jackson wrote a whole book 
about um, you know, judicial supremacy. He had just litigated a case in 1939, uh, all the way up to the Supreme Court, that involved an, a, a, a universal injunction against an agency determination. Um, he won that case on standing grounds, but he didn't even mention it in his book. Like the scope of the relief of, of that case was just not something that, um, you know, that he thought worth mentioning. So I just, I would just really caution against drawing, um, you know, uh, draw, she is, as a drawing negative inferences from um, people's accounts of the historical record. Uh, I want to ask about why um, we've seen a spike with the Obama administration, and then particularly with the Trump administration but in a moment. But I just want to understand a little bit better what's at stake uh, and the history, other than getting the history right, which of course is, is always important. But it does seem that there's something more at stake here. And Mila, you alluded to the constitutional, constitutionality question, which we'll come to in a moment. But for either, for both of you, what's at stake in, in, in uh, the history uh, and understanding whether this is a longer historical practice or whether it fits more of a recent historical practice? Um, so, you know, to, to my eye, the, the reason um, the thing that's at stake here is the meaning of Article Three and the Judiciary Act, and and the what, what's being asserted is that those sources of law uh, impose this crisp rule on federal courts, under which federal courts can never grant relief to anybody that's not um, a, a plaintiff um, or a member of a certified class, which is a mechanism that wasn't invented until 1966. So we're talking about what the you know what the what the meaning of those of those legal provisions are, and the you know an originalist ish argument is being made, um, and it's it's something that you have to take very seriously because Article Three and you know, the, the, these questions are obviously uh, central. This is a central provision of our Constitution, and it, it should not be you know lightly uh, cabined. And Congress's power should not be lightly cabined. So really, what's at stake here is, you know, Congress's authority to act under the Constitution, um, and what Article Three permits or forbids. So um, I think there's there are a couple ends of the methodological spectrum where the history wouldn't really matter. A kind of like Baptist and Bootleggers Alliance, where if you if you think it's just static at like 1789 equity power, then <coughs> subsequent developments don't matter. Uh, that's one way to read Grupo Mexicano, a, a equity case from the 90s. Um, uh, on the other hand, if you think that history doesn't have any claims on us for uh, how to exercise judicial power, it's just about um, functional arguments, then the history isn't going to particularly matter. So, but in between, the history is going to matter in several ways. One is it could um, help shape our understanding of what counts as a case or controversy in the judicial power under Article Three, especially since uh, we tend to look to practice to understand that. Um, so that's one answer. Another answer is um, uh, these need to be based in equity. They need to have a traditional equitable basis unless they're authorized by statute. And so if you're not going to call time in 1789, and you shouldn't, you should allow equity to develop as a tradition, then how it's developed as a tradition matters and whether something is well-rooted in that tradition or not matters. And then the last way the historical arguments come in is one of the things that's sort of going on behind the scenes with the disagreement on uh, nationwide injunctions is arguments about coherence with other aspects of our judicial practice and our language. So, for example, um, if you think about judges acting on a statute or a rule, striking it down, for example, to use the, um, the common terminology, then it gets really easy to get to a national injunction. It is just in the intellectual slipstream of that kind of language. Because if something is struck down, like what are we still doing? Why are we still applying it to people? It doesn't make any sense. On the other hand, we have a whole bunch of practices that um, have courts operating with respect to the parties. Um, and um, these include um, um, preclusion limits on the federal government, US versus Mendoza. These include the requirements for class actions, the difficulty of getting virtual representation, um, the fact that a district court decision has no precedential authority outside the, the, in other courts, even other district courts, judges in the same district. So, so you have different kinds of practices going on, and the question is what coheres with them? And if this is old, 
and well-rooted, then it makes it easier to make arguments that this coheres with our judicial tradition. And if it is something we kind of backed into accidentally and didn't really ever endorse and have a considered conversation about until it just gets exploited by red state AGs at the end of the Obama administration, then it looks different. So I think in each of those layers, the history matters, though it wouldn't matter at the two poles. Can I ask you both a question about <clears throat> tradi evolving tradition pra and practice, particularly with respect to equitable considerations, right? Which, as you say, equity must evolve, and how one thinks about that against a backdrop of the rule of law. Uh, and I'll come to the constitutional question, put off the partisan question in a moment. So um, do we, that is do you, do we, big we, have a um, theoretical conception of how equity ought to evolve um, and how that fits with the rule of law and kind of like where are we in a practice when we can say, oh yeah, we do actually have a firm and established uh, tradition. Right? How should we think about that? Sure, so you know, there's, there's, many, there's many senses of the word uh, equity, and the, 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 at, at the sense that I'm going to use it in here is just a, a very technical sense of like, what are the sorts of things that a court of equity should be thinking about when it's giving, uh, when it's giving relief? And one of those things is making sure that uh, people, uh, that, that the law is applied in a, in a uniform way. Another is making sure that uh, pragmatic and practical uh, solutions um, are achieved. Another, another is, ensure, is ensuring that injunctive relief is, uh, is, is, you know, is, is properly tailored to the harm that's being uh, suffered. We have a number of these equitable uh, principles. And then, you know, and of course, in the, in the injunctions test itself, there's a, there's a requirement that the court consider the public interest um, when, it, when it gives an injunction um, and, the, and whether or not irreparable harm will result to the plaintiff. So, you know, the, the flexibility of those tests um, has, does not include any type of crisp rule of pure, of a, of a, of a, that would require the injunction only restrain the defendant with respect to the plaintiff. The injunction against future violations of the law is, uh, is as, as Doug Laycock has said, the simplest use of the injunction. When, when that is, you know, that, that's the heart of it. Right? You're a court is telling the defendant, stop doing this thing that if you continue to do, will be a violation of the law and will cause irreparable harm. It, that is one very simple way to understand what these universal or nationwide injunctions are. They're just directing that to stop. And we want courts to have um, that power. There's other mechanisms that, you know, that, um, that equity has developed um, that have uh, modern footprints in our law and civil procedure. You have learned about you know, various joinder rules uh, you know, in pleader. You know, all of these rules that you study, intervention, right? <laughs> and these are all, you know, these are all the offspring of equity. And what are they designed to do? They're designed to prevent circuity of action, multiplicity of suits. They're designed to make sure that courts do not get overwhelmed by a whole bunch of, you know, redundant, pointless lawsuits that all, you know, could have all been settled at once. You know, th this is a this is a need in our judicial system that that y you, know, you can see responded to with these federal rules of civil procedure. But back in the day, they called it the Bill of Peace, right? That's what it was called, and that mechanism for settling a legal question for a whole bunch of people at once was carried forward into our law. Um, and you know, the, the the universal or nationwide injunction is 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 just another another variety of that. Um, so you know, so I think when you consider these broader aims um, of of equity, um, in the sense in which I'm discussing it, uh, you you will see why this injunction is not out of keeping with those uh, traditions in any way. Sam Bray. Um, so uh, we have gotten rather technical quickly, both <laughs> me referring to Grupo Mexicano and uh, Professor Sahoni to Impleter. So if you had those on your bingo card, you can check them. <laughs> <off. laughs> um, so um, the question about how equity evolves is a really important one. So um, going back to uh, the Nicomachean ethics, er, uh, equity has been conceived of as something that operates when a, a general rule 
can't capture all the circumstances. So it's always got this kind of liminal frontier, the rule is running out kind of quality to it. Um, and that was important for the self-conception of the chancellors as they developed equity and, and still get cited sometimes, Justice Breyer cited that passage uh, several years ago. Um, so that matters for this though, because it means that equity is always a little bit dangerous. If nobody's frightened by your equity, you're probably not doing it right. <laughs> but what that means is that the capacity for equity to do justice is really high. But the capacity for equity to be perceived as doing injustice, to shift power from democratically elected branches, is always potent. And if we don't pay attention to that and how equity evolves, then the, 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 the equilibrium will not be powerful equity with no limits. The equilibrium will be no equity. So if you want equity and you want the good things equity and equitable remedies like injunctions can do, you have to pay heed to the limits. In fact, uh, there's a line from uh, Dean Langdell um, about a hundred and- You've been holding that in, haven't you? I have been. <laughs> Actually, I, don't, I didn't think about it for today. It just occurred to me. But um, uh, there's a line from Dean Langdell about 130 years ago who said that if you want to understand equity, you have to pay attention not only to its strength, but to its weakness. And I think that's crucial here. Um, so it's got enormous powers, but you've got to pay attention to limits. Okay, so where do the limits come from? So this is one of the things that, that's tricky about it is they're not, they don't tend to be in statutes. There's no like federal equity statute that's reticulated and detailed. Um, they tend to be customary. Their texture is often a little fuzzier than, than um, late modern uh, positivists may be comfortable with. And, um, and yet, they act on the judge's judgment. They're focal considerations for how equitable powers are to be exercised. And in my view, one of those key aspects of the practice of equity is that you're resolving the case between the parties. You might have to bring in a lot of parties. There might be a lot of parties. All of these um, multiplicity of suit management devices that we have now, like the class action, come out of equity. Um, but they're all for this discrete group and they're gonna be managed in both ways. If the class wins, the class wins. If the class loses, the class loses. But um, the national injunction has a different kind of structure. So, um, so in terms of the history, I, I think this is the million dollar question, is how you think that equity is gonna evolve. And the last big case where the justice is really squared off on this. They've talked a lot about traditional equitable principles. About once a year they have a case where they refer to them, um, often in ERISA. Um, but, um, but the last one where they really showed, um, had a showdown methodologically was in Grupo Mexicana between Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg. And Justice Scalia, uh, he got the words right. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, she got the music right. And uh, the answer is probably a little bit in between. Um, but uh, that's the million dollar question. Mila, if, if you wouldn't mind saying something about, so um, Sam I think has sort of laid out the, um, the framework for him, which is look, there, it's the parties, the injunction applies to the parties before the court, right? As I, as I understand what, what you're saying, Sam. And the justification for it is, look, this is, an important but dangerous power, and there ought to be prudential considerations in terms of how it applies, and so this is where I will draw the line. All right, do I, do I have you right? Yeah. Without like Dell. Um, okay, so what, what, is you, what is your framework, and what is your picture, and what is your justification? Right, so, okay, so I think that there's, you know, you, when, you, when you see something out in the world that you don't like, <laughs> that, that, that bothers, that just rubs you the wrong way, it bothers you to see um, courts acting in this particular way, perhaps it bothers you to see agencies acting in this way or Congress acting in this way. You know, we, you often notice that people have one of two responses. Either they say there's a hard constitutional rule against that thing because that problem is so bad that it needs to be outlawed, it needs to be pushed off the table entirely through, through you know, reading into or creating some constitutional limit, 
Or another res common response is to say, let's try to solve this problem through legislative mechanisms, through rule mechanisms, through softer mechanisms than, um, than restricting that danger through a constitutional pronouncement. So that, I, mean, I, I think, you know, I, I, I agree that there are, you know, there are um, policy problems with these injunctions. I think we're going to talk about them uh, soon. Um, I, I agree that we, in general terms, should care about prudential considerations and that prudence is important. And who could, who could think that prudence wasn't important, right? I mean, obviously, that's important. Um, but, but does that all add up to um, something that you can say is you know, crisply embedded in Article 3 as like a hard limit? I mean, these, the, the, the rules about parties were, um, and in inequity and the types of protections that people are entitled to equity were entitled to, allowed people to seek relief for those who are similarly situated to them. If you think about that, it just, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, what, like for, for those who are similarly situated, the same, the same relief should, uh, uh, should, should obtain. Um, because otherwise you have people who are exactly similarly situated to, treated differently. So you know, there's a justice question here, there's an equity, there's an equality question, uh, uh, there's a value of equality on the table um, as well. But you know, just my, 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 my baseline message is you, you should be very careful when you're talking about reading hard constitutional limits uh, into Article 3 uh, or, you know, or, or even into these um, very, uh, uh, very old, you know, sort of foundational statutes like the like the Judiciary Act, um, and uh, and because you know, those are pretty hard to, to 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 mess with. You're really tinkering with the source code when you when you go and do that. All right, let's talk about the policy considerations because we haven't talked about them yet. And so I want to understand better what the problems. What's the problem? Um, look, I like Texas. Um, and if there's a good judge in Texas that um, will enjoin a clearly unconstitutional statute against the world, um, you know, don't mess with Texas. Let's do it. I, do, I don't see what the problem is. So please help us help us to understand what the what the issues are. What are what are the problems, and why should we care? Do you want to do the problems and me do the benefits? Or? <laughs> you know, actually, we maybe we should talk a little bit before the problems about like what the like why have they become more frequent in the last twenty years? Because I feel like that that will help so, sort the problems on the on the table a little bit. And sure. I um you know I because like I said I, I do think the nationwide injunction um, did did go up uh, more in more recent yeah years. I mean and, yeah. in Trump's first term I think there were probably like twenty plus um, injunctions. There have been a hundred against uh, the Trump administration total. and the Biden administration together. Yeah, and I think 20 total in the, in, from the Obama administration, right? So it's like a, a real spike. Okay, so why, why, and then we can talk about problems. Yeah, so I mean, okay, so one, one thing is, is that you have to, when you're evaluating the, 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 the pace of change or the rate of increase, you've got to think about what the baseline level of illegality in the executive branch is, right? Because if you have, if you What have, is the implication that you're saying? You guys can do the math, but, right? uh, but if you have an administration that's cutting a lot of corners, that isn't paying a lot of attention to its lawyers' advice, uh, is, you know, is just generally rushing administrative action out, you should not be surprised if that type of an administration gets subjected to a lot of injunctions, nationwide and otherwise. Um, like if you speed a lot, you're going to get a lot of speed, speeding tickets, and that shouldn't shouldn't be uh, a surprise. Um, so that's that's one I think <coughs> important point to put on the table, and that sort of suggests some other um, potential causes. Like you know, if you look at the 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 pattern of the uptick from George W. Bush to Obama to uh, to Trump, uh, to Biden, you know, to, to me that more recent trend suggests that the issue is really uh, the executive branch having to take more leeway with old statutes, having to you know pour new wine from old bottles, and the underlying cause of that is you know you know polarization and partisanship, you know, increasing the you know, increase in congressional gridlock, um, and you know, and that itself comes from much bigger societal uh, forces. Um, that you know that aren't just about the judges. 
Um, I think, you know, doc doctrinally, I think much of, I think Sam might agree that like the, the state standing in Massachusetts v. EPA um, might have made a difference too. Um, and I think in recent years we've seen a lot of, um, a, a lot of coordination amongst different state attorney general's offices and state solicitor general's offices and you just, they, clearly they are now very well prepared, these offices, to organize together and litigate in tandem against any federal policy that they, that they dislike. Um, so, I mean, I guess my, 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 one, my point is, is that these are causes, these causes of this uptick are, um, you know, are multifarious and they're, and they're sort of spread out across society uh, and doctrine in different ways and, you know, I'm not sure how easy they are all to uh, address, but if you were just knocking out the nationwide injunction, you'd be, in a sense, knocking out that symptom, but not the, the root cause. So I think um, those are, those are uh, all part of the picture. Um, and uh, I, think that, I think it's a, not just a modest uptick, though. It's a, it's a huge spike that has reset our judicial politics. So if you go back to the challenges the states brought against the um, Affordable Care Act and the individual mandate um, just about um, uh, 14 years ago, um, there was no request for a nationwide injunction. Now if you were bringing that suit, it would sort of be malpractice not to. Um, so that's how quickly things have changed. So it might be your entire time in law school has been like this, but it's not. Um, it's not been like this very long. So I just throw in a few other factors. Um, I think that the institutional side is important that Professor Sohony mentioned, the state SGs uh, arming up. They've gotten much more sophisticated, much more professional. Um, uh, going back to the 90s with uh, 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 now Judge Sutton in uh, Ohio. Um, state standing is a big part of it. Um, the judicial polarization is a big part of it too. Um, and so the way the state standing interacts is you've got a relatively abstract plaintiff and maybe a coalition of 25 relatively abstract plaintiffs that can pick wherever they want to sue. And you get heightened judicial polarization, so then the form shopping options are really great. And um, because you're, what you're getting is a nationwide injunction, it doesn't matter where you get it. So all of those three things work together. It's, it's kind of a perfect storm. So I agree, it's not just one thing. It's not just the nationwide injunction. Are you ready now to tell us? <laughs> Yes, now I'm ready. Okay, right. <laughs> why, why it's a problem. <laughs> um, okay. so, so I just, for, first of all, I just want to say that this question, you know, should district courts issue um, nationwide injunctions, is not the same thing as the question, should district courts decide really important questions nationwide? <laughs> um, and that's because there's, there's, injunctions that are said to be, uh, uh, said to seek indivisible relief that opponents of nationwide injunctions are totally fine with. There's also injunctions where um, the nationwide scope of relief is said to be necessary to protect the plaintiff in the case, and that frequently happens in these state, um, sort of state brigade cases. Um, and, and so what that means is that even if you abolished nationwide injunctions, um, you would still be left in a world where district courts would be issuing nationwide relief, but just that they would be doing so in indivisible relief or um, you know, uh, relief, complete, uh, relief necessary to provide complete relief to the plaintiff uh, cases. Um, and so anyway, to me that points to the, to the biggest problem policy problem with, with these injunctions. And I see it as a people problem, not a not an Article Three problem. It's just, it's the it's forum shopping, and more recently, it's, it's judge shopping. Um, uh, but there are other uh, problems as well. You know, there's, the, these injunctions have the potential to uh, depress the amount of percolation that a legal question gets. They have, um, the, they create a risk of uh, conflicting injunctions. If, you know, there's, there's at least that's a at least that's a theoretical risk that a court might say, do this and not do this at the same time. Um, these injunctions cause uh, the government to have to seek emergency relief uh, on a very rushed basis, and results in scenarios like uh, like Sam was talking about, where you know a case winds up before the Supreme Court on a pretty undeveloped uh, record. So those are all like those are all different policy problems with these um, injunctions. Um, 
Do you want to add more? So I, I think of the problems as falling into three basic buckets. There are the coherence problems, the way they don't fit with other aspects of our legal system. I've already mentioned some of those, such as end run around the class action. You get all the benefits of a nationwide class action, but without actually having to meet the requirements. So th that kind of problem, coherence problem. Then there are the decision-making problems, and Professor Sahoni has mentioned some of these. So um, uh, the, court, the Supreme Court is not going to do its best work on um, a appeal very rapidly from a preliminary injunction from one district court in Texas. This is not the way it's going to do its best work. Um, big questions, um, questions about health care, questions about abortion, questions about um, uh, immigration, questions about executive power, all of these questions, that's not the posture we want. We want slow, deliberate, conflicting decisions from courts of appeals, and then the Supreme Court gets the circuit split. And it takes longer to get there, but we'll get better results in the end. Sam, can I, and I'll ask this to both you and Mila, like, who is the we, right? Because there's certainly a set of we's who view this as yet another tool in the legislative process, um, and who want something very different. Um, right, and then there is the we. I assume you mean what is good for the institution, for the institution as a whole of law and legal development. Uh, and then the question is like, who are the guardians of that we? Right. Because it's clearly not the federal judges, because they're they're the ones whose behavior that one is trying, at least some of them, that one is trying to curtail. It probably it doesn't sound like it's the judicial system, even the federal judicial system as a whole, because. They don't seem to be imposing um, any real limits. There are some there are debates, right? It's not the political process. So um, um, learned law professors, definitely the most important uh, people in God's America, right? Uh, but but leaving those Let's people aside, uh, right? Um, who 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 is the we? So there are different ways to do it, and you've just um, uh, highlighted a number of the different levels. But I think the key we here is the we the people, democratically. So Congress is elected through our democracy. The president is elected through our democracy. Now, our democracy is deeply imperfect. I am in no way saying, oh, we've arrived, we've got it. But the democratic pedigree of those two branches is higher than the kind of bank shot democratic pedigree of the federal courts. And this is the third moment in our national life where the, there has been a consuming constitutional question has been the power of courts vis-a-vis -vis the other branches. So one of these was labor injunctions, late 19th, early 20th century. Lots of people wrote articles titled government by judiciary. Um, the next is desegregation decrees after Brown. Again, people wrote articles saying government by judiciary. Um, and now we get the third. Now if you note the political valence of these is quite different. The political valence of the, the ones against the labor injunction were conservative. The political valence of the, um, the desegregation decrees is more progressive. Now, though, they cut across both sides. There is no systematic right-left valence for the nationwide injunction. But there is a democratic asymmetry. They systematically keep presidents from doing anything. So we elect a president. And then whoever we elect as the president can't do anything, at least second half of the second Obama term to the present, because of nationwide injunctions. And so that, that's fundamentally a huge inertia weight on our body politic that keeps it from functioning, that um, keeps us from doing bad things, keeps us from doing good things. But part of democracy is you do things. H.L. Minken said, democracy is when the people get what they want and they get it good and hard. And it's very hard for that to happen if everything the president tries to do gets stopped. So I just am um, always very suspicious when people start throwing around terms like anti-democratic. I mean, this is like, this is a, the concept, the meaning of that concept is, is very uh, contested. And you know, just the two examples that were just given, you know, of labor injunctions and desegregation decrees as being instances of government by judiciary, you can ask yourselves, well, were those anti-democratic uh, exercises of judicial power or not? Were desegregation decrees uh, suppressing democracy or were they, or were they enhancing uh, people's lives in a, in a way that allowed full citizenship to really be exercised and 
and flourish and equality to flourish and, and, and democracy to be ultimately strengthened. So you know, nowadays, um, you know, so, so I guess I resist any blanket opposition of you know, the judicial power to issue injunctions on the one hand and democracy on the other. Um, and, and, and even with respect to just the federal executive today, um, you know, I, I think it's important to remember that part and parcel of Congress acting, of Congress legislating, of Congress enabling agencies to do all of the things that we want uh, agencies to do, part of that is Congress being confident that it has uh, that there's a that there's a secure web of judicial checks out there to make sure that agencies don't act outside the bounds of their statutory or constitutional authority, that they don't act in arbitrary and capricious ways. And that safety net is an aspect of, it's a prop of Congress's own democratic power to delegate and to ask agencies to regulate. Um, and so when you, when you, you know, so there's no, as I said, there's no easy, uh, way to categorize that type of judicial review of, of agency uh, action as uh, anti-democratic or, uh, or, or pro-democratic. Uh, it's what Congress wants, and in that sense, it's dem democratic. As, as we were, I'll pull out a quote now, as Lewis Jaffe said, <laughs> the, it is a necessary, uh, uh, the ex existence of judicial review is a necessary condition, both uh, psych psychologically, if not logically, uh, of, of, of delegation. I think I, I mangled that quote, but that's the basic idea. <laughs> and we agree, we agree on that, the importance of judicial review and also the um, legitimacy of injunctions with democracy. Injunctions themselves are not anti-democratic, um, but um, that doesn't mean they can't be. We're going to uh, engage in some exercise of democratic practice, but at least hearing from the people uh, in a moment. So as you prepare your questions for our remaining few minutes, there's a microphone. There are microphones here. Just um, you both seem to agree, at least at the very least, that there are excesses, um, right? Um, so what can be done um, as a way as a way of transitioning to some of the questions? All right. So I see uh, hands. We can go ahead and give the mic, uh, mic while. Uh, both of you talk a little bit about what what are some solutions here so okay so my solutions are all predicated on the proposition that i'm right about <laughs> article three, right? so all my solutions are going to to just accept that it's okay for a court to give an injunction that wholly uh that that sets aside a rule uh or sort of it pauses a rule universally that applies nationwide whatever i'm assuming i'm just going to assume that that power exists uh, because I, I think it exists. Um, and, I, and then I'm going to propose that, that that power be channeled to uh, groups of judges or courts that, uh, where you can't go and you know, pick, you know, pick the judge that's going to be deciding your case. So one very simple solution would be to channel everything to the DDC. Another solution would be to lottery amongst district courts. Another would be to require um, you know, three judge courts, probably without the right of direct appeal to the Supreme Court, um, again, these are all like people solutions. These are all uh, aimed at bringing in more, uh, more, you know, more judicial minds, um, and and I and I would urge that 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 type of reform um, be focused on the type of relief that's being sought, whether or not it is a true nationwide injunction or not. So if you're if you're seeking indivisible relief or relief that's necessary to protect the plaintiff, that 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 entails that the decree be nationwide, you should be treated the same way as if you're seeking um, a, tr a truly universal or nationwide uh, injunction in the sense that um, Sam and I have been talking about it. Um, because I just think there's, these cases are too hard to sort and jurisdictional rules should be clear. And so if you're seeking that kind of relief and, and you're, you're, you're then told to go to the DDC, well then you know where to go and you can just get on with it. Sam. <laughs> So uh, I, uh, as you can imagine, I would uh, have a little different reform proposal. I, I don't want to normalize the chaos of the last decade, and I don't want to lock that into statute and authorize it, So um, even, with, even with adjustments. So, um, and you would get, imagine the intense political dynamics you would get over the appointment of uh, district court judges in DC if they're the ones who give all the national injunctions. Uh, we'd have uh, nearly Supreme Court level uh, theatrics uh, for those, uh, those nomination hearings. 
So I wouldn't do that. What I would do is say, if you've taken a wrong turn, you should go back. You should go back to the exit where you got off, and you should like, keep going on the highway. So uh, stop giving national injunctions. Now, I want to be clear that um, an injunction can have incidental benefits for non-parties. And it is absolutely true that sometimes the injunction that protects the parties is going to have spillover effects. If you, if you enjoin the nuisance for neighbor A, you're enjoining the nuisance for neighbor B, too. Um, if you are going to give one child a desegregated school, you're going to give every child a desegregated school, and you should, which is why those, those uh, desegregation injunctions tend to be class actions, because they fit the, the class you need. So there are going to be cases where you can't really give relief just for uh, the party, and that's okay. That's the the uh, equitable tradition has no trouble with that. But um, to go beyond that and to give an injunction where you don't have to for non-parties, just say no. But see, that's the I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, one, one moment. Let, let's we, let's hear from the from the people at least like a couple of them, uh, and then we can um, you can use it as an excuse to to jump back in. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brandon Sharp. I'm with 3L. My question is mostly for Professor Gray. Uh, at times, it seems like the court has actually uh, shaped the scope of the injunction to the violation and not necessarily the party. Say, Califano in the prison litigation context, it wasn't just that prison, it was all prisons in California. You addressed um, desegregation, but Swan wasn't a class action. Um, but yet, it desegregated all of Mecklenburg County, so it wasn't looking at party specific. So, were those cases wrongly decided? Should they dismiss and said, hey, form a class action? Or, uh, I'm interested in your response. Uh, so, I don't think those cases were wrongly decided, and I think they, I think they, um, they were either class actions or other forms of representative suit, or cases where you truly did have indivisible relief. And um, if you historically, you see at different levels of government this playing out differently. So um, municipalities, you, um, courts tended to conceive of everybody in the municipality or in the school district as sort of like shareholders in a corporation. They're all a unit, and you can do things on behalf of some of them for the unit. And it's a kind of quasi-representative suit. When you move up to states, it's more complicated. When you move up to the national level, like. Courts for all, you used to say no way when explicitly faced with that question, as in um, Frothingham and Mellon. Mila, you wanted to get back in on um, the on Sam's remedies. Yeah. So I, thank you. So I, I guess I just want to point out that like there are many of these of the many of the most problematic, the most uh, talked about, the most criticized nationwide injunctions fall into those two boxes that Sam just exempted from being treated as nationwide injunctions. Like, like the, the parties and the courts understood those as being you know, indivisible relief injunctions or injunctions where the relief, where the nationwide relief was necessary to uh, protect the plaintiff, you know, in that case, you know, whatever, some set of states, right? So the um, Pennsylvania contraception case that I mentioned, you know, the, the, the DAPA case out of Texas, uh, you know, even Trump v. Hawaii, right, they were all rationalized on that ground. So this is just why, um, this is just why I think that insisting on that formal line, it just doesn't make a whole lot of practical sense. If what you're worried about is, is forum shopped district courts, you know, like issuing injunctions that will have massive consequences on their own uh, steam without, you know, sufficient, uh, uh, briefing and subscription cogitation, then treat those injunctions as a category and move them to a better court or move them to a more, or put them in front of more judges. Um, and then you can solve all those, uh, all those problems and not get like sort of <coughs> stuck in these esoteric line drawing exercises between whether something is indivisible or, or not. Sam, I'm, I'm, you've been I, I'm not against uh, ever having to do esoteric line drawing. <laughs> <laughs> you plead guilty. Uh, judges do it, <laughs> professors do it. But, uh, but I also don't think these cases are those. I think um, often what's going on is there's a kind of sloppiness about standing and about what the relevant interest is. And so, uh, for example, Texas wants to stop an Obama immigration policy, and it says because we'll have to pay for driver's licenses. So if... Um, if the federal government makes Texas whole on driver's licenses, their standing injury is gone. Like, why do they get to control the immigration policy? 
based on their tiny little driver's licenses claim. Um, same kind of issue for the student loans. Uh, Missouri, like I don't think Mo Missouri had standing through Mohila, but even if you do, the injunction should only operate with respect to the loans through Mohila. Now, once you get up to the Supreme Court, you get a precedent that can control across. But there's no reason to the lower court let the tail of the small injury to losing finder's fees through Mohila to Missouri allow Missouri to get the massive dog of a uh, huge uh, national injunction. So we're going to read some of those diff cases differently, but it will require more granular attention to standing and matching the remedy to the standing. All right, we are going to leave it, unless I see one more hand or question. All right, we're going to leave it here. First, let's thank the Dean's Office and the, our Dean, uh, John Manning, and all those, everybody else who's brought us around this forum. And then obviously, let's thank our brilliant uh, speakers for today, Professor Melissa Honey, Professor Sam Gray. because you're God's favorite nerds. <laughs>